three groups hiding in plain sight have been manipulating the world of scientific research. They were first noticed when we discovered that most published scientific findings are false. And as untouchable as they may feel, we know of their existence. And this gives us the chance to dethrone them. It's the year 2010. A harrowing discovery has just been made in the world of science. It turns out that whenever a new phenomenon is discovered, no matter the field of research, its effects seem to vanish over time. An initial paper might claim that a given process speeds up something by 70%, only for that number to quickly precipitate to a much lower magnitude in the years following the initial discovery. This was one of the traces left by the people at the top of our conspiracy. But it was not the only one. And during that same period, two big findings would come out and they would further empower a revolution that has yet to truly reach its peak. In 1996, a foundational paper was released in the world of psychology. It studied the phenomenon of priming, the brain's response to two consecutive stimuli. This paper spread like wildfire. It got thousands of citations, which means that thousands of scientific discoveries and hypotheses were proven or disproven based on the assumption that the findings of this paper were true. And even worse, this paper made its way into university classes. Hundreds of thousands of psychology students across the world acquired knowledge that was proven to be most likely false over 10 years later. In the 2010s, someone decided to replicate the study and they failed. This prompted a slew of replication studies and most of them again failed. Then even more tangible and depressing discoveries were made. Bayer and Amgen, two behemoths of the biotechnology sector, tried to replicate the most popular studies in the field of preclinical cancer studies. They could only successfully replicate between 11 and 20% of all studies. In the worst case scenario, this means that four out of five findings that come before clinical trials are actually false. And even worse, long before all of this, long before the start of the collapse, someone predicted it all. And most of the people who agreed with him were ignored or even shunned for going against the establishment of academia. And this is someone you might know of if you've been watching this channel for more than six days. Derek Desola Price. He was the world's forefront expert on the oldest computer that we know of. It's over 2000 years old and I've made a pretty good video about it if I can say so myself, so go check it out. But anyways, he's also known as the father of Scientometrics, the discipline that tries to find mathematical ways to measure the utility and impact of individual scientific articles, scientists and scientific publications. In his most popular book from 1963, he predicted an age of senility for science, caused by the shortcomings of the current evaluation methods, crumbling under the exponentially growing size of the world of scientific research. And he wasn't alone in making such claims. In the following years, several people voiced concerns regarding the lack of replication studies across all domains of science. But back then, information traveled a lot slower. And so this idea didn't really gain any significant momentum and the embers of this revolution would lie dormant for another 50 years when one of the biggest scams in science was put under the spotlight. This is the p-value, the most popular measurement used to tell good science from bad science. It's also one of the favorite tools of the unethical scientists belonging to the first group of that mysterious hierarchy I've told you about. Let's see how it works with some cool animations. Suppose I have a coin and suppose I want to prove whether my coin is fair or not. If it's a fair coin, whenever I toss it, I have a 50% chance of getting heads and a 50% chance of getting tails. A fair coin would also tell you to check out my Patreon for lots of completely free extra content. Let's make the hypothesis that this is in fact a fair coin and let's experiment. I throw the coin a hundred times and this is what I get. If I use some math that we don't really have to delve into, I can calculate the probability of getting an outcome at least as extreme as this one if the coin is truly fair. This probability divided by 100 is the p-value. In science, when you get a p-value below 0.05, you can safely claim that your initial hypothesis is false. In my case, we can see that with a fair coin, I'd have a less than 5% probability of getting this outcome or something more uneven. So I can safely say that this is not a fair coin. But 
I lied to you. I hid from you the other 5,211 runs of the experiment, in which I got very average outcomes, very close to 50-50. And if we take them all together, it becomes quite clear that the coin is, in fact, as fair as it gets. Congratulations! You have just discovered one of the most popular scams in science. P-hacking. Claiming that you got a really low p-value when trying to disprove an hypothesis without disclosing that you actually performed the experiment several times until you got a batch of data that would suit your narrative. But why would most scientists even do something so evil? And I also naively like to believe that unethical scientists are a minority in the world of research. So why would p-hacking be so important. Well, let me introduce you to the second most influential group in our evil pyramid, the people enabling the corruption of science. Fake science spreads faster. It's a finding from the University of California, San Diego. Or San Diego, California? No, I got it right. They discovered this in 2021 and it's even worse than it sounds. First and foremost, unreplicable articles get more citations than the replicable ones, but even worse is that if replication studies come out disproving the fake research, nothing changes. The fake, non-replicable piece of research keeps getting more citations than legit research in the same field. And when you combine all of that with the publish or perish culture of the scientific community, it all clicks into place. Financial interests have been plaguing science. Researchers work under intense stress in high pressure environments where they are rewarded for the works that can be best converted into catchy news titles. When monetization becomes the primary target, truth and accuracy become side effects of the vain act of pretend science. This is the publish or perish world, a reality for many, many researchers. In here, there is no interest for accountability. Replicating studies to verify their claims is a waste of precious time and money, which can be much better spent on chasing the next trend. Maybe we can use state-of-the-art AI to supplant oncologists for good. Maybe we can even replace factory workers. Hell, let's get rid of the consumers as well. Those stupid fucks wouldn't have the money to buy anything anyways. This is the world of science. And at the top of the pyramid sits the true evil. A tiny group of corporate profiteers. These big journals, they're not run by scientists. They run by suits with degrees in business administration. Multi-billion dollar behemoths of entertainment. Releasing periodical collections of the struggle of hundreds of thousands of researchers. Pushed to compromise morals for paychecks. It's never been about knowledge. It's always been about money. The system has not buckled under the weight of inadequate statistical tools. It's always been working as intended. And we've only just taken notice. The impact factor. It's a metric indicating the expected number of citations that a work is going to get in its first year after being published on a specific journal. It turns out that the most impactful journals, the ones that have the biggest outreach, are the most biased towards catchy titles and new innovative research. They favor such findings over more robust but less alluring or less catchy findings. And they're more likely to refuse your scientific article if it's a lame replication experiment. According to a 2016 survey published on Nature, which is the journal with the highest impact factor, by the way, and the irony of this is not lost on me, of 1,576 interviewed researchers, 70% of them claimed that in their careers they have failed to replicate someone else's findings at least once. Even worse, less than half of them even ever tried to publish a replication experiment in their careers. And to truly drive how serious this is, in an ideal world at least 50% of all published studies should be replication studies. This is because for every serious piece of research there should be at least someone else independently verifying your claims. Luckily, someone is trying to bring this reality about. There was a very important international cooperation project trying to replicate the most important findings in the world of cancer biology. They tried to replicate 53 studies, which contained a total of 193 experiments. Now, excluding the ones that they couldn't replicate, for the ones that they managed to replicate, they discovered that the measured effects were, on average, 
85% smaller than the original claims. And for over a third of the experiments, they had to get in touch with the original scientists to ask for information pertaining to key reagents necessary in the laboratory procedures. They had to rely on the goodwill of said people. And what if some of them had died or retired and brought the secret to their graves? And now I'd like to ask you how many of the 193 experiments were fully documented? So how many of them allowed to perform a perfect step-by-step -step replication without leaving out any important detail? The answer? Zero percent. And of all places, the world of cancer research cannot tolerate this trust me bro mentality. It can't fly here. Guys, what are the kings and queens up to on the desk? There are also malicious organizations whose purpose is aiding malicious researchers in producing fraudulent data. Proper rackets, sometimes involving big names from established institutions. This year, Harvard, for the first time in 80 years, revoked the tenure of a professor because they believed that the person in question faked several works. I couldn't fit everything in this video. I've had a hell of a month health-wise, as you can probably still hear. And I'm not even sure you'd fully enjoy this topic. I feel like you might actually completely hate this video. So let's strike a deal. If this video reaches 300 likes, which is a very attainable goal for my audience, I'll make a part two. There's lots of stuff I found that I haven't told you about yet. But in the meantime, let me leave you with something to think about. From the depths of my ignorance, it seems that a quiet scientific revolution is in full swing. Political systems, social hierarchies, ideologies, they all come and go. But the incorruptible, real scientific method has outlived all of them. Malicious actors have been actively hindering science, the epitome of human curiosity, and the fact that we know poses an unprecedented threat for those sitting at the top.